Thank you. All right, uh, let's, let's hope that this works here. So anyways, it's a great honor for me to be here. It's been a few years since I have been with Leading with Power, but there's a lot of stuff that uh, I want to be able to get through with all of you today. So I thank you for the opportunity for me to be here with all of you uh, today. I have titled this Addiction, How It Affects Our Ability to Lead in Our Faith, Family, and Our Finances. So in the year 2004, I found myself, in, of, of all places, in Samara, Iraq. And so then if the enemy, if they could have taken a doll blade to my neck and all of uh, the American soldiers, that's what they would have liked to do. But anyways, the very first day that we get into Iraq in 2004, we're, we're walking down the street and the indigenous population, they knew that there was going to be this new changing of the guards. The old soldiers were leaving and there are going to be new soldiers coming into Samara, Iraq. And so all of us soldiers were walking down the street and all the little kids, they're now out to see who are the new American soldiers. And so then as we're walking through, I could just see all their eyes and they're looking at all of us American soldiers. And so, you know, I'm a little bit vertically disadvantaged, uh, <laughs> but they're looking at all these American soldiers and then they get to me and then their head has to go down a little bit. And so then uh, one of the Iraqi kids, he runs up to me and he says, you are Jackie Chan. <laughs> I was like the first Asian person that they had ever seen before. And so for the entire year when I was in Iraq, they called me Jackie Chan because uh, I was that one Hmong person. <laughs> but nobody ever wakes up and you know, nobody just says, well, today let me start hanging out with a bunch of felons, inmates, people that have addiction, people that need jobs. And so my story, it takes you back into time. It takes you to a very far off place into Southeast Asia. As you all know, Americans were in Southeast Asia to try to stop the expansion of communism. And so then the Hmong people, we were involved in helping them to do that. And so then in 1973, US forces pulled out of Southeast Asia. The enemy now, they started to turn their weapons against the Hmong people because we have been allies with the Americans during the Vietnam War. And so then my parents knew that they could no longer safely live in the country of Laos. When the communists came into my parents' village, they took my three older siblings running through the jungles of Laos. Unfortunately, as my parents were running through the jungles of Laos, due to disease, malnutrition, and starvation, all three of my older siblings um, ended up getting buried in the jungles before my, my family could get into the refugee camps in Thailand. And it was in the refugee camps where that's where I was born. And so I'm actually the first family member, uh, first child um, out of my family to survive the Vietnam War. And so in 1987, we moved here to central Wisconsin. And the reason why is because we were granted political asylum to come to the United States. A lot of people still don't know this, but I ask people, you know, of all the places that the Hmong people could have came to, why central Wisconsin? And some people are like, well, they love the cheese here. <laughs> well, we actually didn't have cheese until we came here, so we didn't know what that was. The reason why we came here was because of the local churches. So the, the Catholics and the Lutheran churches, they were willing to sponsor the Hmong families and that's the reason why today there's such a large Hmong population here. But growing up, this is my childhood home. And so we lived in a duplex. We lived upstairs. And by now, I'm the oldest of nine kids. So all that my father could afford was this upstairs duplex. So my mom and dad, they had one bedroom. And there was only one other available bedroom. So all nine of us kids we were jam-packed into this other bedroom. And to make matters worse, the entire duplex was cockroach infested. So that's how I ended up growing up here in central Wisconsin. I was very thankful that I'm no longer living in poverty, but by American standards, we continue to just struggle. And so my background is a lot of poverty. In 2000, I graduated from Wasa West High School and that fall I went to college at UW-Stevens Point. And then a year later, 9-11 happened. And I thought a lot about this particular event. Even though I am a refugee, I was coined a legal alien, so I could not vote. But I still felt like I needed to do something to make America safer, even though I'm not a full-fledged American citizen. 
And so without my citizenship, I still thought, you know what, I'm going to defend America. And so in 2002, I signed up as a non-citizen to be a part of the Wisconsin National Guard as a combat infantry soldier. And I went to boot camp down in Fort Benning, Georgia. I was the only crazy Hmong soldier there. <laughs> Everybody is like, what is a Hmong person doing here? I'm like, well, I feel like I'm an American, you know? And so the right American thing to do is to defend and sign up for uh, protecting our country. After I graduated from boot camp, Uncle Sam says, I have an all expense free paid trip to the beautiful, lovely, warm country of Iraq for you. And so from 2004 to 2005, I was deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom. We were stationed in Samarra, Iraq. Samarra was located an hour and a half north of Baghdad. And so every day, our mission as US soldiers was to go and make sure that the city of Samarra was going to be free of insurgents. They did not like American soldiers there. And so they were going to do everything to kill American soldiers. And so every day we would have to go and patrol the streets looking for weapons cache. So we're talking about RPGs, grenades, AKs, IEDs, rockets, everything that they can find. They wanted to kill us American soldiers. Sometimes we would find these weapons, sometimes we wouldn't. And so then in war, you see the worst of what humanity can do to each other. And it's also really painful when you have to come upon children that have been hurt or killed because of the violence of this war. On December 26th of 2004, we were just on a routine foot patrol to enforce the curfew. Samara, Iraq is so dangerous because the insurgents, they kept on planting all these IEDs, improvised explosive devices, all these bombs. They wouldn't plant these bombs during the daytime because we can see them. And so then they would plant them at night. So every night, American soldiers, we would have to go and patrol the entire city, making sure that the insurgents were not going to plant these IEDs. And so on December 26, we had just gotten into Iraq for about three weeks. And so on that particular night, that's what it looked like with my night vision goggles. So that's as far as the visibility is what we can see. On that particular evening, on our mission, the first man in charge of the entire formation this was Staff Sergeant Todd Olson from Loyal, Wisconsin. You have to imagine this being at night. And so it was completely pitch black dark. And so when we got to this spot, Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, he was right there. There was another sergeant that was right over here. And then I was number three from the front. We did not know it, but next to Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, the insurgents had already planted an IED that night. The enemy, they have such sophisticated weapons now. And so then all they needed was a remote control. So from hundreds of yards away, they saw our shadowy figures. They knew where their bomb was. And using a remote control, when Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, when he got next to that bomb, Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, that was detonated. He became the second soldier from Wisconsin to die uh, in Iraq. So that was a really life-changing moment. You know, when you're 24, you think you're going to live forever. You think you're immortal, but when you see your friend get blown up in front of you, all of a sudden, your mortality becomes very real. You realize that, you know what, maybe I'm not going to make it out of here alive. And so then, I thought long and hard about what I'm going to do. And you start to realize that, you know what, I cannot save myself. The only person that can save me, it is God. So in desperation, I made a desperate deal with God and I just said, God, if you can get me out of Iraq alive, when I come back to Wausau, I'll dedicate my entire life to you. A few months later, we ended up losing another soldier to an IED. And so by the end of 2005, we came back with 23 out of the 25 soldiers over from Nielsville. In 2008, I graduated from the university with my teaching degree. I became a sixth grade social studies teacher. This is my family today. I have six kids and a dog. So fast forward to the year 2015, and I start to feel really guilty, like I'm supposed to do something. And that was when God came knocking on my heart, and he says, hello, yo. Remember 10 years ago, I'm going to take you to a really bad place in your life. You were so desperate that we made this deal, and you told me that you were going to do something. 
well, you've been squandering 10 years here on earth and you're not doing anything. So what are you going to do? So then I felt really guilty. I felt really bad. That was the promise that I had made to God. And so then, strangely enough, in 2015, a Hmong pastor and a Caucasian pastor, they both said, hey, we think you make a really good church planter, somebody that just goes and starts up a church. And I just thought, that's really cool. What we need here is a multi-ethnic church. So then in January of 2016, I started the Cross Church. It's a multi-ethnic, non-denominational church. We're located on Grand Avenue in Schofield. After we started the church, my favorite Bible verse in all of the Bible, Jesus' final words to his disciples. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go. Like churches and pastors, we need to be going. Too often we've gotten so comfortable just kind of staying. And so God was really encouraging me to just go out there and make disciples. And so then I really asked God, God, what does it mean for, for me to go? And so then God started to, to make me aware that, you know what? There are people in our community over by the downtown area, by the gazebo, under the bridge. They are homeless. They need you to go over there and to encourage them. So go and pray for them. Go let them know that they're not invisible. Go let them know that you care about them. So I started to go and hang out with them just to let them know that we care a lot about them. And I started to realize that at the root of a lot of their homelessness, they kept on telling me about their addictions to drugs and to alcohol. So this was that one thing that continued to just hold them back. It was their addiction. For the last seven years now, I have been going inside of the Marathon County Jail to do Bible study with the inmates. So on Wednesdays, I do a Bible study with the female inmates. And then on Friday, I do a Bible study with the male inmates. So when you see on TV a lot of these criminals, so the murderers, the rapists, the robbers, the drug dealers, these are the ones that come into my Bible study. I shake their hand and I tell them about the sins that they have done, but their sins can be forgiven through the love of Jesus Christ. And so I have that opportunity to be able to transform their life around because it's during that time where they're, they're, they're like the most vulnerable. Their heart's really apt to change. And so again, the number one reason why they're locked up, it's because of their addiction. So in 2019, I ended up taking over what is called the Joseph Project. Uh, there are individuals in our community. They have paid their debt to society. So they have done their crime, but they have done their time. And now coming out of incarceration, they want to change their life around by getting a job. But too often, the biggest barrier to addicts, homeless people, incarcerated people, felons, is that when they go and fill out that application, it asks them, what is your criminal background? Do you have any felonies? A lot of the people that I work with, they have to check that box. It's a lot more easier for HR directors to hire on the non-felon than the convicted felon. And it's because of this that a lot of these people, they, they want to change their life around through employment. It's so hard for them to get employment. So through the Joseph Project, they come to our church. We give them class on life skills, job skills, and the Christian faith. And currently, we partner with eight local businesses that are considered second chance employers. So they understand that I'm graduating individuals that have a checkered pass, but they want to redeem themselves with employment. So then, um, this is supposed to say, uh, so there's some formatting issues, but 75% or 100% of our students will graduate from the Joseph Project. So most of these individuals will get a job. And I can track their job retention. But unfortunately, in three months' time, 75 or 100% of the students that had a job, in three months' time, that goes down to 25%. So then I would go and talk to these students that lose their job, and I would ask them, hey, what happened? And again, the number one answer is my addiction. So I got paid. And so then I thought that I could just get high one more time, and when tomorrow comes, I'm going to stop. I got paid, so I thought I could go to the bar one more time, and so today's going to be the last day that I'm going to drink, and tomorrow I'm going to stop. Well, when you're an addict, tomorrow never comes. That is the lie that you tell yourself, and so then you continue to live that lie for many years. Many years becomes many decades. One incarceration sentence becomes many incarceration sentence, and before they know it, they can't get a grip on their addiction. And so I work with, uh, with addicts each and every day. What's really sad 
is that as a young pastor, so then uh, in my first five years of being a pastor, in those first five years, I did six funerals in those five years. And five of the six funerals that I did were for individuals under the age of 35, all related to overdoses. One of these happens to be Alex Drake. I met Alex Drake, and so then, you know, uh, I've talked to his parents, and they want me to share Alex's story with all of you. I met Alex inside the Marathon County Jail. He was there because of drug-related charges. Alex ended up doing his time inside Marathon County Jail. And when he got out, he started to come to the church, which was really good. But after a while, sometimes usually they kind of disappear from me. When they disappear from me, it's usually not a good sign. And then a few months later, I ended up finding on Facebook that Alex Drake had overdose on heroin. He had been given some bad drugs that was laced with fentanyl. And uh, when Alex, when he was locked up for a few months, his body started to change. So before, he was doing some really hard drugs, and after several months of being sober, his body could no longer tolerate the, the tolerance level of the heroin that he was doing. And when he got out, he thought that he could still take the same amount, and that completely knocked him out. And so then the family called me to say, hey, Pastor Yao, would you be willing to do his funeral? So it's really sad. Like, I get called upon by these families that are now grieving, family members that have all died from drug overdoses. And after a while, you start burying all these young people in the community. It starts to really mess with your head. Like, how many more young people do I need to bury? Because these are individuals that had so much life ahead of them, but because of addiction, their life has been cut short because of that. So we have some short-term places for, the pop, uh, for this population, but what they really need are long-term places. We really need long-term programming in central Wisconsin. And so then in uh, 2018, I started to gather some Christians in the community, and together we prayed, and we came up with the idea that we need a Gospel TLC, which is a transformational living center. So the Gospel TLC, it is a Christ-centered, long-term, three to 18 months, it is a residential facility for individuals that truly want to transform their life from addiction and brokenness. So if you want a sober place to live, that's going to help you deal with your addiction and your brokenness. And what I mean by brokenness is kind of like mental health. The reason why a lot of these people struggle with their addiction is because of all the hurt and all the pain that they've been going through. So in order to deal with the hurt and the pain and the mental health, they numb it with the drugs and the alcohol. And so the Gospel TLC, it is that place that can help them. So last year we were able to, to buy and completely purchase the Gospel TLC facility that is located in Weston. And so then uh, our entire facility has nine bedrooms, uh, four living rooms, five bathrooms, uh, a classroom, some uh, offices. And so then it's just a wonderful space. And our tentative opening is for spring or summer of this year. So I'm really excited that uh, maybe instead of like burying young people, that maybe perhaps now we could actually have them come to this place and we can prevent them from overdosing and dying so early. And so I can't do this by myself. And so the only way that we're able to operate is obviously through the generosity and through the kindness of the entire community. So my passion has really come to deal with addiction. And this is something that I'm really passionate about. I truly believe that here in America, at one of the most affluent, wealthiest, most technologically advanced country in all of the entire world, we have a problem that is bringing our country under. And that has to do with addiction. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to talk about this family. We like to just kind of sweep it under the rug. It's someone else's issues. They can deal with that. I want to put my blinders on. It has nothing to do with me. But the reality is that addiction affects every single one of us. And so nobody wakes up an addict. I want you guys to know that after working with all these addicts for all these years, nobody just wakes up one day and be like, well, today I'm really bored, so let me just stick a needle into my arm and let me just become a drug addict. That's not how it works. Not only that, but sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, why can't they just quit? Why can't they just stop? Well, it's a lot more difficult than just pushing a button to be on drugs or to get off of drugs. 
And so the answer, it's really complicated as far as what we're going to do to be able to help these individuals. And that's the reason why the most important thing that we can do is really get to know an individual. Like uh, instead of asking uh, the question of like, why are you like this? The more important question is like, what happened to you? How did this happen? Tell me your story. Because every story is unique and every story that's going to involve success is also different. So what works for one person might not always work for the other person. So when we talk about addiction, this is a head and a heart issue. And the reason why I say it's a head and a heart issue is because there are things that's happened to the individuals. So maybe as a child, your parents told you that you were good for nothing. Maybe they told you that you're an idiot, that you're just a loser. Well, after you hear this so much in your heart, you start to believe that, you know what? Maybe I am this failure. Maybe I'm never going to be good enough. And that's really painful to come to the realization that everybody thinks so negatively of you. And so when your head is thinking all of these really negative thoughts about who you are, the easy way to numb the hurt and the pain inside of your heart it is to numb it with the drugs, to numb it with the alcohol, and all these horrible things that's going to just help you to escape it. When we think about uh, addiction, coping strategies are really important. Most inmates that I meet up with, I will ask them, okay, so when you were very angry or when this happened to you, what did you do? And the rational answer that all of us would say, well, maybe I walked away or I was a better person to take the high road. For a lot of these individuals, they don't have positive coping mechanisms. And so then without the positive coping mechanisms, they're going to go to the drugs to deal with their issues. They're going to go to the alcohol to deal with their issues. And so what these individuals need is they need to be trained to have positive coping strategies. All right. Somebody recently told me, because I raised pigs on a farm, okay? Somebody recently told me that uh, when they went to work, one of their counselors told them that they were a pig. And I'm like, oh, that's really offensive that they called you a pig. Why would they call you a pig? Because I had met this individual while they were inside the Marathon County Jail, and I knew that they have an addiction problem. And so this person said, well, pig is actually an acronym, and it's not that bad. I'm like, okay, so what does pig stand for? Um, so then this person says, well, my counselor says, I'm a pig. I'm a person of instant gratification. Person of instant gratification. So when there's some of these stress, when some of these worries, when some of these challenges come in the instant gratification, it's like, okay, well, I can take this and it's going to make everything feel instantaneously better. It does at that very moment, but it's actually very deceptive because the more you do that, you're digging yourself just a bigger hole. And so they're a pig, okay? So uh, somebody once said, addiction is the only prison where the locks are on the inside. So every addict, they are battling these demons that are inside of them. And so those chains are inside of them. And they're going to have to figure out within their willpower how it is that they're going to get outside of this inner enclosure that they're locked inside. So addiction destroys everything. Everything good that you are doing, when you decide that, you know what, uh, maybe this thing is going to solve it for me. Maybe the drugs and the alcohol, maybe that's going to help me. That's going to destroy everything. I don't know of a single addict that their life hasn't been in one destroyed. So like I told you, I, I live on a farm and so I raise some pigs. So both of these pigs, they were both born together. So they were just a few days apart. What is the difference between uh, kind of the two pigs besides the color? The size or the weight, right? Okay, so I'm kind of new to pig farming. I've been a city slicker all, most all of my entire life, but three years ago, I moved on the country and so I thought, okay, well, since I'm on the country now, I better start to do some things with some animals. And so I've just come to just truly love raising pigs. And there's been a learning curve with raising animals. Both of them pretty much born the same exact time, but
but there's a major size difference. Can anybody tell me why there might be such a size difference? They have access to the same food and everything. Okay. Okay, maybe the run to the litter? Well, the answer is this, and I didn't know this, but somebody had to help me. They said, well, yeah, the reason why that pig is so much more smaller and scrawnier than the other one is because most likely that smaller pig, it has worms inside of it, okay? So when you have internal intestinal worms, every time that pig eats, that worm inside of them, actually a few worms, that will suck all the nutrients, the healthy nutrients away from the body. And now that worm just absorbs all the healthy nutrients. So without the, the healthy nutrients, that body isn't able to fully grow. Obviously, healthy pig without worm, that is the pig with the worms. The people that I hang out with, their form of addiction, it just happens to be illegal. But I don't think any one of us should think, well, I'm not like the drug addict. I'm not the alcoholic on the street corner. Because the reality is all of us, we all deal with addiction. So my addiction, it just happens to be hunting. It happens to be fishing. It happens to be spending time in the outdoors. I would just love to be able to do this every day, all day, because this is what makes me feel happy. I feel on top of the world when I can be doing these things, but the reality is I can't always be doing this. All right, um, so when you're still an addict, addiction affects everybody. Maybe even you yourself are an addict. It's going to affect your family members, your friends, your coworkers, community members. So every single one of us, we are impacted by addiction in one form or another. Maybe in the past, like you've had some alcohol issues, you've had some drug issues. Your families have had to deal with you when you were going through that. So addiction has no discrimination. It doesn't matter if you're black, you're white. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. When we talk about addiction, it does not discriminate. So all of us are impacted by that. Addiction is this ball and chain. Until you can get rid of that, you will never be able to fully move on in life. It is going to continue to hold you back until you hit rock bottom. So until you hit rock bottom, you're going to reach out for help. And a while back, there was a lady that I was trying to help. And I asked her, like, why should I help you this time? And she goes, well, it's because I've, I've hit rock bottom. And so I asked her, what is your definition of hitting rock bottom? And she goes, do you know where I was sleeping last night, Pastor Yao? And I said, I don't. She goes, I was sleeping on some rocks under the bridge. I had literally hit rock bottom. So for her, being homeless because of her drug addiction, sleeping on, on a, a bunch of rocks under the bridge, this is as low as she can go. And so then it really made her realize, I have to start changing myself for the better. We have to be really careful that when it comes to addicts, that we're helping them instead of enabling them. Because sometimes they will come to us and they will say, well, I need money, I need help. And we have to be really careful because sometimes the money that you give them, instead of it going to the good things that they tell you that it's gonna go to, it actually just goes to continue to support their drug or their alcohol. And so if somebody ever says to you, hey, uh, I need some gas money because my car is low on gas, instead of them giving them 20 bucks, you can say, okay, well, if that's truly the case, uh, why don't you meet me at Quick Trip and I can pump $20 of gas inside of your car. That way you know that your money is not going to support their addiction. Drugs take you to hell, disguise as heaven. So when you talk about all these addictions, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, you name it. In the beginning, it looks so beautiful. It's like this heavenly thing. But really, this addiction is really just going to take you to hell because it is disguised as the best thing ever. So addiction, uh, it affects the three Fs. And so these three Fs, the first one is faith, family, and finances. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is related to faith. 
Uh, I believe that there is a God-shaped hole in the human heart that only God can fill. So I believe that in every single one of us, there's a special spot in our heart where that belongs to God. And so what a lot of people have done is they have tried to take out God. And so then when they take out drugs, I mean, when they take out God, they have tried to fill that with drugs, with alcohol, with gambling, with sex and porn, you name it. Uh, instead of worshiping the one true God, that one thing becomes the God that they worship. But they're never going to truly find that joy until they worship the one true God. And so you're never going to be completely happy if you're going to substitute God for all these other things in your life. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to see that. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says that it is important that for us, we be a sober mind because the devil is disguised and he's always going to be coming to try to attack us. And if you're not of sober mind, you don't even know when the enemy is going to be attacking you. Um, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit is actually self-control. And so if we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are supposed to have self-control. So that becomes an issue when we don't have self-control. The second part, it is related to family. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, um, I'm not sure if we can see it, but addiction just affects so many people. So it's really sad. In my time that I've been working uh, as a religious leader in the community, it's really sad when I see that fathers are not stepping up to do the things that they need to do. Like you as the father, the Bible says that you are to be the head of the household. You need to go and provide for your family. Well, when you're using drugs, when you're using alcohol, you can't provide for your family. And eventually, you're going to then lose your job. Once you lose your job, you're going to lose your apartment. You're going to lose everything that you have. It breaks my heart when I work in the community and I see some of these families that are living out of their vehicles. To me, the onus and the responsibility I pen that up upon the Father because it is your responsibility. You're the one that decided to bring life into these children. It's because of this that you need to make sure that you're the responsible parent to make sure that your, parent, your children are going to be housed, that they're going to be warm, that they're going to be fed. And so too many fathers are not able to become the father that the Bible tells us to become because of addiction, because that's what they're struggling with. You can't be a good father when you're locked up inside of the Marathon County Jail. So like 80 to 90% of the jail population are men. And most of these men are fathers. And it breaks my heart when I talk to their family members that's on the outside. I talk to the kids and the kids are like, I don't even remember the last time I saw my father anymore. And so we have so many broken families in America today because the fathers are not stepping up to be the true fathers but instead they're engaging all of these really destructive addictive behavior that gets them in trouble and when they're in trouble they're going to be locked up and when they're locked up then they continue to be pulled away from their family members what's really sad is the generational cycle of addiction and so it's like grandpa was an addict and then the son becomes an addict and then the grandkids become an addict. So I have a friend that is a prosecutor. And when I was talking to this friend that was a prosecutor, I asked him, tell me about your experience in prosecuting addicts, you know? And he's like, the worst story that I can tell you is that as a DA, as a prosecutor in a different county, he said, in seven years time, so within seven years, this one prosecutor, he ended up prosecuting three generations. So the grandpa was an addict. He prosecuted the grandpa. A few years later, he prosecuted the father. And then within seven years, he also prosecuted their grandson. How do we expect our, our families to thrive when our families are more obsessed with all these addiction instead of taking care of our family. 
And so this is something that truly tears away at my heart is to realize that if we don't nip this in the bud, like we're going to pass this on to our children and to our great, great, great grandchildren as well too. The worst result of addiction besides homelessness and incar- in, instead of incarceration, it is actually death. I have met too many inmates that I do a Bible study with that all have a lot of drug addiction issues. They get out and I'm able to see them on Facebook and they seem to be doing okay. And then a few months later, you see the obituary of that person now dead. I can't even count anymore how many friends I have developed inside the Marathon County Jail that today are no longer alive. And so the worst result of addiction It is death. The greatest addiction that husbands struggle with is this. And so this is something that I'm really passionate about speaking. And this is the reason why I'm actually here. Because I don't want you or your family or people at your church to struggle through this. Because I truly believe that after seven years of pastoring, this is the number one addiction that is impacting a lot of us men in this room. It is pornography. Nobody likes to talk about it. It's the silent thing where we're able to do and nobody is able to know. But eventually, our addiction to pornography, it is going to rear its ugly head. And I have met too many men in our community that have been impacted by addiction. And I no longer want this to impact you or your friends or your family or the church. Pornography truly becomes a ball and chain. So when it comes to pornography, I know of men that have given up every addiction except for pornography. So there's this particular individual that I'm working with. So he was exposed to drugs and alcohol at a very young age, but specifically at the age of six, he was uh, exposed to pornography and just inappropriate sexual material. And so ever since he was the age of six, this has been something that has been playing out throughout his entire life. And as he's grown up, he's had addictions to drugs, he's had addictions to alcohol, and when I met him three years ago inside the Marathon County Jail, It was because of his addiction to drugs. And then he got out, and then I didn't see him for a very long time. And then recently I saw him again, and we started to just kind of talk. And he's like, and I asked him, hey, how's your drug addiction? He goes, I've actually been clean of drugs for the last three years. And so I'm like, that's all the reason to celebrate. But he was still very bummed out. I I can tell that. So I'm like, come on, like your biggest struggle is drugs and you haven't done drugs for the last three years. This is every reason to celebrate. But he says, but I can't seem to kick that one addiction that I've been struggling with ever since the age of six. And I said, what is that? And he said, pornography. So this has a stronghold. There are people that I know that can kick the drugs and the alcohol, but when it comes to the pornography, They can't kick that out. I know of several husbands who couldn't be intimate with their wives. And the reason why was because they were watching pornography each and every day. And it's because they were watching pornography each and every day that at the end of the night, when the wife wanted to be intimate, the husband was no longer able to be intimate. Well, you do that for a few weeks, a few months, and a few years, and there's going to be this disconnect. There is no longer going to be intimacy. I have met too many husbands that are now divorced. Why? Because of their addiction to their pornography. When their wife wanted them the most, they were not able to perform. To me, this is what's happening into our families today. I know of men who've had pornography issues that have eventually led to adulterous relationships. So a porn addict, uh, they might start off with 
with soft porn, but eventually it needs to be just more harder, just more just aggressive. And so when they watch these things, this is the expectations that they're having that their spouse is going to be able to do. Well, not all their spouses are able to do that. And so then it starts to, it starts to lead them into having relationships with other women. And eventually then they have these adulterous relationships, which eventually destroys their entire marriage. So this is what I'm seeing. And it really hurts me to see that at the root of all this, we as husbands and fathers, we have a duty to make sure that we're on top of things because when we're not, if we allow addiction to get us, it's going to lead to destruction. So here's what I want to do. And so I want to be able to have a group in the community and we're going to tackle this issue of pornography and sex addiction. It's going to be an anonymous, an anonymous group of men. And I want us to start having conversations about the effects of sex addiction and pornography because I know that this is impacting a lot of families in our community today. There is not much of a difference between, oh, non-Christian uh, husbands, um, they're only addicted to uh, pornography and sex. The same number reigns true for even Christians too. So there isn't much difference between Christians and non-Christians when it comes to addiction with sex or pornography. So there's this book, it's called Proven Men to Be On Guard, A Proven Path to Sexual Integrity. And so that's kind of the, the back page to that. But what I want to do is to be able to form a group and we need to start having healthy conversations about how we as men can come together to help each other to be able to overcome our addiction to sex and pornography. Because if we, if we don't, your marriage is going to be destroyed. And I truly believe that Satan's greatest way to destroy our Christian faith today, it is through the family. And so we cannot allow Satan to have a grip over our family. But if addiction is on top of that, eventually it's going to destroy marriages and families. And then finances, the third F about addiction impacting finances. Well, when the father can no longer be there to provide, when you're homeless, when you're incarcerated, when you're dead, there is no way that you as a father can responsibly provide for your family or to be there for your wife. And that's the reason why it's really important that we have a good handle on this addiction because without you being the head of the father to be the breadwinner to help your family out, none of these things are going to work. So then I've been telling you about a lot of problems and so then here is kind of the solution. Let's see if this works. What causes, say, heroin addiction? This is a really stupid question, right? It's obvious. We all know it. Heroin causes heroin addiction. Here's how it works. If you use heroin, by day 21, your body would physically crave the drug ferociously because there are chemical hooks to the drug. That's what addiction means. But there's a catch. Almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. stronger heroin than any addict can get on the street because it's not contaminated by all the stuff drug dealers dilute it with. There are people near you being given loads of deluxe heroin in hospitals right now, so at least some of them should become addicts. But this has been closely studied. It doesn't happen. Your grandmother wasn't turned into a junkie by her hip replacement. Why is that? Our current theory of addiction comes in part from a series of experiments that were carried out earlier in the 20th century. The experiment is simple. You take a rat and put it in a cage with two water bottles. One is just water, the other is water laced with heroin or cocaine. Almost every time you run this experiment, the rat will become obsessed with the drugged water and keep coming back for more and more until it kills itself. But in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander, a professor of psychology, noticed something odd about this experiment. The rat is put in the cage all alone. It has nothing to do but take the drugs. What would happen, he wondered, if we tried this differently? So he built Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. 
It's a rush cage where the rats would have cub balls, tumbles to scamper down, plenty of friends to play with, and they could have loads of sex. Everything a rat about town could want. And they would have the drug water and the normal water bottles. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, rats hardly ever use the drug water. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. But maybe this is a quirk of rats, right? Well, helpfully, there was a human experiment along the same lines. The Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using a lot of heroin. People back home were really panicked because they thought there would be hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war was over. But a study followed the soldiers home and found something striking. They didn't go to rehab. They didn't even go into withdrawal. The bulk of the citizens just stopped after they got home. If you believe the old theory of addiction, that makes no sense. But if you believe Professor Alexander's theory, it makes perfect sense. Because if you're put into a horrific jungle in a foreign country where you don't want to be, and you can be forced to kill or die at any moment, doing heroin is a great way to spend your time. But if you go back to your nice home with your friends and your family, it's the equivalent of being taken out of that first cage and put into a human rat park. It's not the chemicals, it's your cage. We need to think about addiction differently. Human beings have an innate need to bond and connect. When we are happy and healthy, we will bond with the people around us. But when we can't, because we're traumatized, isolated, or beaten down by life, we will bond with something that gives us some sense of relief. So these individuals, they hang out with toxic people at toxic places. They, they do toxic play activities. And what we need to do is we need to take that out. So in order for us to help them, they need positive people at a positive place to do positive play activities. So here at the end, you can't be leading with power if you're leading with addiction because it is going to suck the longevity and the vitality of your life. Um, so that's my contact information. If you would like to kind of just talk a little bit more, if you're interested in signing up for that group that I talked about. Uh, but I'm just really passionate about addiction because I want all of us to be, light, to be living robust lives, but we can't do that if addiction is a part of that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.